Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Journalism is under siege. Activism is reaching new levels. And if the first week of the Trump administration is any indication, access journalism in a free press will have to fight along with activists every day, just the way my guest Barrett Brown did. After four years behind bars, journalist and activist Barrett Brown was released from federal prison on the morning of November 29, 2016, and ordered to report to a halfway house in Dallas, Texas. Brown faced 100 years in prison in 2013 for charges stemming from the hacking of the private intelligence firm Stratfor. The hack, of which the hacker group Anonymous took credit, revealed Stratfor was hired to spy on activist groups for major corporations. Barrett was pegged as a spokesman and co-conspirator for Anonymous despite renouncing ties with the group in 2011. And the most controversial charge brought against him by the Department of Justice was for linking to hacked data. That charge was eventually dropped. Subsequently, Brown accepted a plea deal under which he pled guilty to lesser charges for threatening an FBI agent and also pled guilty to being an accessory to a cyber attack and to obstruction of justice for putting his laptops in a kitchen cabinet. After over two years of pretrial incarceration, he was sentenced to 63 months in prison. While incarcerated, Brown wrote award-winning columns where he denounced prison life and administration. He wrote about the endless stream of abuses and misconduct by the Bureau of Prisons, all of which resulted in multiple stints and solitary confinement and restrictions on his access to the press and the use of email. Today, Barrett Brown is out of prison and planning his next act. It is my pleasure to welcome Barrett Brown to Radio Who, What, Why. Barrett, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I want to go back a little bit and talk a little bit about the work that you were involved in, going back to to something that was called Project PM, which was a combination of journalism and hacktivism at the time. It was really at a a cutting edge of of a certain kind of activity. Tell us a little about that. Uh, Project PM grew out of my dissatisfaction with the press at large, and particularly with the opinion industry, uh, that many of the pundits, uh, the the highest-rated uh, pundits in this country with the New York Times, the Washington Post, Thomas Friedman, Charles Krautheimer, these people have won Pulitzers. But if you go back and look at their output over the past 15 years, they've been demonstrably wrong about their predictions about m- many of our major issues we face as a country, particularly military engagements. Uh, it didn't look like there was any any negative feedback uh, in, in the media for the most part. And uh, Project PM originally was intended to provide that media feedback, that negative feedback by bringing together some of the more cogent journalists and bloggers uh, forcing these issues into attention by uh, sort of uh, bringing to a bringing to a head uh, these sort of uh, failures uh, in a way that they can't couldn't be ignored. Uh, and then when I started talking to Anonymous, I was approached. I'd been approached by uh, Greg Ausch, who had sort of functioned as one of the main organizers in, in recent years. Uh, I got involved with Anonymous uh, at the end of 2010, and uh, when when the Tunisian Revolution started, they were heavily involved in that. Uh, and then from there, things just kind of took their own momentum. And uh, pretty soon I was uh, one of the figures who was heavily involved in, in strategy, uh, heavily involved in, in explaining to the press what we were doing, uh, why it had to be done. Uh, when the H.P. Gary incident occurred, when uh, Anonymous hacked this company and revealed this extraordinary conspiracy against journalists like Glenn Greenwald uh, that had been set in motion by the DOJ and perpetrated by several uh very prominent uh, intelligence contracting firms, most notably Pal- Palantir under Peter Thiel. Uh, things, again, sort of accelerated again, uh, and I got into this long, drawn-out conflict with this entire intelligence contracting sector. So at that point, Project PM sort of shifted gears, and our uh, main area of responsibility was to take these stolen emails that Anonymous had, had a acquired from H.B. Gary and a few other firms uh, that included correspondence with government agents and included correspondence with other firms uh, as they went about creating these technologies and uh, perpetrating these these really indefensible conspiracies. Our job was to take all this information that, for the most part, had kind of been uh, was quickly forgotten uh, by the press in, in the immediate wake of the story and uh, create a picture of this this otherwise opaque industry, this, this cyber intelligence complex uh, that we call it. Uh, so the other journalists could, could proceed with this. They could take the next step, look at individual issues that we could only do so much on. Uh, and there's a lot more to it, but that was that was our our key issue because it's a fundamental issue. If we have these these this clandestine network of statists 
uh, in, and, in the government and outside the government working together uh, against activists and journalists in a way that strikes at the citizens' right to know and in a way that's, that's patently illegal. Uh, and if they don't even get, if there's no consequences for it. You, if even when they're discovered, uh, no one really suffers. Uh, obviously, they're going to keep doing it, and they did keep doing it. Uh, we, we later stumbled upon other similar uh, instances of this, this kind of conduct by similar actors. Uh, so it, it took on the, the, the character less of an investigation and more of just outright uh, warfare. Uh, and this went on for, for about a year. Finally, I was arrested, and you know, and then I shifted gears again to prison reform, and now I'm out. And there's there's several things that all kind of have to be addressed as a whole, and that's what you know, that's what I'm working on now. Talk a little bit about what you think are the central things that have come out of this that need to be addressed now, that you want to address now, that perhaps might be even clearer to the public in light of what has transpired over the past seven or eight years. Well, we know that, first of all, we know that there are many within the government in both parties that are happy to work with these companies uh, in ways that are that are not provided for by the Constitution or by the individual policies, uh, you know, the stated policies of these uh, government agencies. Uh, we know the FBI, we know the DOJ, we definitely know the NSA and CIA have, have transgressed against the American public and against the people of the world over and over again for decades. Uh, we know that that has not ceased. Uh, and we know that now that the Trump administration has taken power. Uh, I think it might be easier for us to make this case that these are dangerous technologies. These are dangerous capabilities. These are dangerous precedents that have been established the past few years when you have these, these people being caught and, and unpunished uh, for these acts. Now I think they can more clearly see what the danger is. Uh, it's no longer an abstract issue of, oh, years from now, maybe these technologies will be misused by some you know, less than reputable uh, administration. Well, now we have that administration. So... I think people who were not too uncomfortable uh, knowing what the Obama administration had and what they had already allowed to be done uh, and what they what the uh, U.S. government as a whole is acquiring in terms of information operations. I think all of that, again, less of an abstract issue now, less of an issue of what could happen someday. Now we're going to see uh, perhaps a necessary conflict occur between elements of the press and between the U.S. government, and that's a conflict that probably should have uh, been a little bit more forcefully executed years ago, but, you know, here we are. Do you think that the role of the mainstream press will be different this time around? Do you think the way the mainstream press responds will be different in this atmosphere? Yes, I think that's already, we're already seeing that, uh, I think, just in the last few days. Obviously, uh, we're, we're seeing an unprecedented degree of just outright and frankly, bizarre dishonesty coming out of the White House in a way that's, you know, not unprecedented, uh, you know, in any fundamental way, but it's really more about, I suppose, a matter of extent. It's more visible. It's, it's less, uh, it's more shameless. And, you know, they're reacting, uh, the press corps is reacting uh, in a way that really they should have years ago when we had these same kind of issues at a lesser scale when you had one, one party making demonstrably false claims over and over again, making these claims because, you know, the dynamics were such that, you know, you could, you, there was, not necessarily a pragmatic reason to, to stick to the truth. You know, if when you're reporting both sides and, and you're not doing the analysis, you're not telling your, your readers, you know, this one, these people are lying. These people are clearly lying. What they're saying is untrue. You know, when you don't do that, it, it makes sense uh, for people without any moral center to conduct themselves in that dishonest way. And now it's just gotten so blatant. Uh, and and the, the, the people concerned, the, the Trump administration, are so openly hostile to the press that, you know, now we're seeing this conflict arise we're, and we'll probably see a more or less permanent uh, change in how the, the press views itself vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the state. Will we see a difference in the behavior of some of these big companies that have been part of what you referred to earlier as the cyber intelligence complex, be they Apple, Google, AT&T or whomever? Well, now they're operating in a in an environment in which you know the the standard is being set by the president on down, and uh, retaliation against your personal enemies, uh, the use of you know new methodologies and technologies by which to interfere with the information flow, by which to obscure things, by which to discredit the enemy. Uh, all of these things will be more and more uh, commonplace. That was already where we were going, simply because again, 
you know, without consequences, without negative feedback in, in that industry. And given that that industry offers a very valuable service to a lot of these companies, the, the ability to obfuscate the public understanding, the ability to target, uh, and harass and discredit, infiltrate even just standard law buying activists and journalists as they've been caught doing, uh, you know, that, that, that creates a climate and that climate sort of perpetuates itself. So even as things get better in some ways, even as more of this becomes more obvious, more plain, uh, you're going to have several different sort of competing factors. Uh, other aspects will get worse. There'll be more poor behavior, as we might call it, uh, among more government agencies as Trump puts in this, this very strange sort of uh, post-ideological right populist contingent, uh, and, you know, and start sort of settling in. Uh, we'll see all kinds of, of very unusual uh, incidents come up and, and we'll see a lot of leaking. We'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of opposition. You'll, you'll see more active uh, civil disobedience than you have uh, since the 70s. But that, that, that's all, I think, pretty clear. I think that's pretty, pretty set. Uh, but beyond that, you go to the chart, look at the details, start trying to predict, you know, how will these things happen? That's where it gets difficult. This is the age of non-state actors. This is the age in which, you know, a few people here and there can, you know, if they're clever enough and if they uh, have the will to do so, can shake things up to, to an extent that, you know, would have been again, impossible just a generation ago. That's all thanks to the internet. It's thanks to the fact that we live in an information age in which for the first time in human history, any individual can collaborate with any other individual on the planet. Uh, that's, that's extraordinary. That's an extraordinary change in how we, uh, arrange our affairs. And when, when that becomes better understood, when the implications start becoming clearer as, as they will, when people learn by example, you're going to see a very chaotic period come into play. What do you see as the platform, the method by which so much of this research and investigation might take place, sort of the more modern equivalent of what you were trying to do with Project PM? Well, I mean, it's a necessary reaction to to a complicated situation in which traditional journalism is not able to do the job even when it, when it does do the job on, and at the level of individual journalists or individual outlets, you know, when, when things get caught up in the noise, th- there is a necessity to start thinking about how do we, how do we better assess the informational environment? How do we better react to it? How do we compete with all of these, these different factions, uh, all of these different actors, all sort of, uh, you know, fighting it out over the, the daily uh, news cycle, you know, for dominance, uh, so there's going to be a, a, a clear and clearer need for new ways of organizing journalism, new ways of, of crowdsourcing the capabilities of people out there who, who would like to contribute, who are experts in their fields or who are capable of doing research. Uh, we need to figure out ways in which to channel uh, their their talents and energies in a way where we can, you know, gain some degree of, of, of civilization uh, in a period in which civilization is deteriorating in very fundamental ways. Uh, that's that's my main focus still is is to uh, pull off this what I'm calling the pursuance system, uh, which was announced and wired two months ago uh, after my release. Uh, this this sort of, sort of uh, platform will be rolling out gradually on an invitation basis, by which people can create their own civic platforms, uh, evolve them in different ways, uh, arrange them in very very clear um, formats, whereby. Anyone can create their own little group. Anyone can join uh, whichever groups are, are available uh, and, and be a part of something, uh, a civic entity that, you know, unlike a nation state that you're born into, uh, has clear moral direction and uh, has the agility that we saw from Anonymous, has the ability to, to bring people quickly into an operation, uh, achieve something, uh, whether limited or, or broad. Uh, and move forward. That's that's the kind of that's the kind of emphasis we need to be we need we need to have when we start thinking about where we go from here. You know, are we going to are we going to stick with traditional institutions and hope they lead the way? Or are we just going to you know uh, write our congressman? Or, or, or are we going to finally start thinking about what is now possible? Uh, there have been so many people with deleterious, uh, I think, effects on society. You know, whether it be Trump or, or whatever who are in some ways using the internet, uh, you know, things like Breitbart uh, in new ways uh, by which to gain a degree of control over the 
conversation. Uh, we need to have more sort of honest, benevolent, policy-oriented people uh, thinking along those same lines, uh, not doing things in the same way, but but likewise taking advantage of this environment uh, in ways that they haven't yet before. And what do you see as the potential risks down the road to the people that are doing that? I mean, the risks are are, are legion. Uh, you know, again, there's 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 nothing, there's no good reason uh, for a company or government agency not to resort to illegal and amoral disinformation operations uh, by which to target their enemies. Uh, there's no reason whatsoever on a practical scale yet. Uh, so anybody who, who, you know, plans to have a real impact right now uh, has to understand uh, what's out there in terms of what these companies do, what they can do, what they've done before, uh, what they can probably do at this point, extrapolating from the capabilities that we uh, came upon, you know, four years ago when the H.P. Gary emails were revealed. Uh, you have to be aware that these are people who play dirty and they have every advantage from a traditional standpoint in terms of government links and, and the fact that, you know, they generally have a great deal of money that, that people were sort of operating against. Uh, so there are ways to counter that. Uh, it just requires that we think, uh, think through the information available. Uh, and, you know, that that's unfortunate that the information we do have, the things that, that were revealed a few years ago, uh, didn't quite get the attention that they needed to, uh, and so part of what we have to do is just sort of re-summing up what happened several years ago, what, what happened with Anonymous and, and uh, you know, what the results were and what was learned so that people understand at least where we're at and, and can start building from there. What were the things that did work with respect to Anonymous? What were the things that you look back on and say, this is something positive we can learn from? In, in terms of operations, there was there was probably about half a dozen that you, could, that you point to and analyze and say these were really, really extraordinary efforts by people around the globe to come together and strike blows against criminalized institutions. Uh, the, and broadly, what Anonymous was able to do was integrate large numbers of sort of early adapters, erudite people, uh, people with different skill sets, and get them working on these, these efforts very quickly uh, in ways that allowed people with the expertise you know, or the charisma or the technical skills or whatever to get their ideas in motion. Uh, it was a chaotic process because it was very haphazard. Uh, Anonymous you know, started out as something entirely different. It's sort of a goofy, uh, you know, internet troll group uh, happened to become an activist group over time, almost by accident. But once it was, you know, it was still using what we call internet relay chat rooms, just big chat rooms where you have lots of people. And then you have sub rooms people could go into to work on various operations. Ultimately, you're using a platform that's not really intended for activism. It was created for chatting. And, you know, as such, that kind of lends uh, just the format itself, the medium itself brings its own problems. You know, you have lots of inviting, you have lots of, uh, you know, periods in which, you know, uh, there's, you're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. You don't know what people are going to do. You don't know who's there. You don't know to what extent uh, you're being infiltrated, you know, on an active basis, which as it turns out, we were, uh, by a number of different parties, most notably the FBI. So we, we can take a lot of those dynamics and, and harness them and keep that agility and keep that ability to integrate citizens very quickly, but we have to be a little bit more rigorous about it. We have to look at, at the sort of specific lessons that we could learn. Uh, we have to look at what, you know, what was useful and what, what the problems were and try to use that to build something new. Talk a little bit about somebody like Peter Thiel, who sort of fits on both sides of this story. How does he fit into all this right now? Well, Thiel came to my attention, again, after H.P. Gary, the Team Themis conspiracy. Uh, there were several firms, including H.P. Gary, Endgame Systems, Barrico, and Palantir, that had sort of come together to create this, this very mercenary uh, information operations division called Team Themis. Palantir was, was a key player in that, and, and their engineer, uh, Matthew Steckman was one of about seven employees who were, you know, as, as the emails show, in on this operation. Uh, that included their own uh, lead counsel. So this wasn't something that a, uh, from Palantir's standpoint, that just some rogue engineer did without the, uh, you know, blessing of the higher-ups. Uh, as we see from the emails, uh, they were happy with Team Themis. Thought it was a great new business model to uh, assist corporations in going after their enemies. So 
Thiel, uh, you know, had the opportunity after this came to light to make a, leg- a real apology and to ensure this doesn't happen again. What he did instead was uh, they put this Matthew Steckman guy, the one who was hardest to detach from, from the, from the uh, team theme scandal, the one who was most visibly culpable, uh, put him on leave uh, briefly. And then when the media moved on uh, a few months later, brought him back uh, as an employee and later promoted him, made him head of business development in D.C. So that is very telling. And that was the first thing I learned about Thiel. I didn't know who he was previous to that. And then since being incarcerated, I happened to see a number of magazine profiles about him. And uh, I don't remember one mentioning Team Themis, which is an unfortunate oversight because, you know, we need to know, you know, what are the implications of a firm like Palantir? And what are the implications of a person like Peter Thiel, who has very, very um, dystopian ideas and is in an unusual position to affect those ideas? not just by virtue of being a billionaire, but by virtue of happening to run a company that does deal in information at a time in which information is king, uh, and who now has very strong ties to this authoritarian uh, White House. That's, uh, that's Peter Thiel in broad strokes. There's any number of, of particular quotes you can look at and actions he's taken uh, that kind of fill those in a little bit more, but I think that's enough such that Peter Thiel should be very high on everyone's list of concerns right now. Mm-hmm. He's, he's one of the most dangerous men in the world at this point, and I don't see any particular reason to think he's going to become any less dangerous in the coming years. And talk, Barrett, finally about what's next for you. How do you see yourself fitting into all this? What do you want to do next? I'm going to take some of the principles that we've been able to observe and act upon, uh, try to coalesce them into something that we can move forward with. Uh, the pursuant system is, is based on something we designed years and years ago uh, before I got involved in Anonymous. Uh, now, it, uh, you know, I'm in a position to sort of draw upon more lessons than I'd, than I'd learned at that early point uh, in kind of fleshing it out. It's, it's a sort of a framework by which people can create these civic entities that we call pursuances, and they can be uh, for a number of things that, that can be used, you know, for or better uh, pursue traditional activism that we use to unite and sort of better integrate different activist groups. Uh, more to the point, uh, anyone can create their own pursuance. Anyone can join any pursuance that, that has, you know, active membership. They can uh, have them organized in different ways. It's something that will channel the, that same agility from anonymous uh, while also, you know, bringing in a uh, sort of degree of necessary rigor, uh, something that can grow and sort of coalesce and develop uh, as these pursuances connect amongst themselves and share resources and share leadership and share direction, something that can ultimately develop into a sort of global superorganism. Uh, something that if we present it right, if, if we make our case properly can be adapted as sort of a parallel state, uh, a non-state, a, a process at war with the system, something that, you know, will, will much better organize the efforts uh, of the huge numbers of people who I think over the next few years are going to be interested in activism simply because activism looks like the only way forward now. Uh, when we have that demand, when that demand starts to arise for radical politics, we have to be in a position to fulfill that demand in a way that uh, inspires people to you know, maybe you know, accept that there are different ways forward beyond our democratic nation states, that there's other things we haven't tried yet and which involve less force, involve less uh, coercion, uh, involve less just inertia, uh, building upon institutions that have come down to us from the accidents of history. We can build something new, uh, especially if we show that we've already done some of these things. They've already worked. It's not like a wacky pipe dream. This is something that we've been uh, sort of coalescing around as a movement, I think, uh, for a long time. We just want to formalize it. So the pursuant system will be rolled out over the next year. The book that I've uh, signed a deal on with uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Garot will be very much centered on the pursuant system. It'll be a memoir and a manifesto. But ultimately, this is going to be about making the case for what I call process democracy, for a non-static democratic associations by which we can maybe move forward as a society uh, as our old society collapses. Barrett Brown, I thank you so much for spending time with us today on Radio Who, What, Why. 
Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening and joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Schechter. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.